Hi gang, the Howling Griffins are a chapter with a long and storied history, both in the lore of Warhammer and outside it. Active since the early days of the Imperium, they pride themselves on being constantly ready for action, their vast forges and colossal turnover of new recruits allowing them to have fought in many of the most brutal campaigns of the last 10,000 years. But that headstrong nature would see them sidelined during the Bad Ab War, unable to contribute in any last way and quickly forced out of the war by the superior numbers of their enemies. The Howling Griffins are one of the most warlike chapters in the service of the Imperium, notable for being at the forefront of a great many of its most famous campaigns. They see themselves as staunch, unyielding defenders of the Imperium and an instrument of the Emperor's purpose and maintain a numerous and well-armed body of warriors that are permanently on a war footing, constantly driven by a rigid code of honour to always be in the thickest of the fighting at the center of the battle. The entire chapter is an unceasing machine of war, requiring massive resources to function, and its structures, culture, and organization are all geared towards keeping that in motion. From manufacturing the material and war gear required to keep such a force active, to replacing the massive rate of attrition that comes with it. The Howling Griffins are a noted and vaunted successor chapter of the Ultramarines Legion, formed in the 33rd millennium. Though their exact founding number is unrecorded, this would place them as a chapter of around the 5th or 6th founding. Unlike many of their fellow Ultramarine successors though, the chapter are decidedly not blue. In fact, the quartered red and yellow livery and their symbol of the Griffin Rampant may point to influences from their adopted homeworld, the planet of Man. Mancora. Mancora has been the chapter planet of the Howling Griffins since their establishment, a feudal world in the Ultima Segmentum. Like many chapter fiefdoms, the system is under full control of the Howling Griffins, and its masters have taken full advantage of this, manipulating the population so as best to serve the recruitment needs of the chapter. Mancora has been held since its discovery at a pre-industrial level of technology, and considerable infiltration by agents of the chapter and the generation of political unrest has ensured that its various kingdoms and nation-states are on an almost permanent war footing. Their nobilities and ruling classes, from which the Howling Griffins draw many of their recruits, are obliged to serve as warriors and military leaders. Skill at arms, personal and family honour, and prowess in battle are culturally important across the planet, and the Howling Griffins believe this heavily martial culture to be a great primer for their new aspirants. The chapter's fortress monastery, though, is not held to the same standards. The Proud Eyrie is home to extensive and advanced forge complexes that tirelessly produce some of the most advanced Astartes war gear known to the Imperium, including rare patterns of armour like the Mark VIII Errant. The forges maintain a state of constant production, and along with their broad recruitment base, this allows their support structures to keep up with the chapter's aggressive rate of campaigning and vast rate of attrition. The Howling Griffins are just proud of this ability to keep in active duty across the breadth of the Imperium. The chapter's been at the forefront of the Imperium's wars for millennia. Early in their history, they were one of three chapters who united to raid the Drakari city of Camorra, rescuing the Salamander's strike cruiser Forgehammer. They fought against the Black Crusades of Abaddon the Despoiler in the Amar persecution and the Valyrian purges. They bested the Orc Empire at Gunnardark and later liberated Van Qualis from Orc attack turning on the renegade Soul Drinkers chapter midway through that campaign. However, their greatest ire is reserved for the Word Bearers Legion of Traitor Marines. It's unknown exactly where all that started, but the Howling Griffins are descendants of the Ultramarines, and that legion had been jealously targeted by the Word Bearers in the Wars of the Horus Heresy, so the grudge might have been centuries old at their founding. Whatever the reason, the Howling Griffins regard the Word Bearers as their greatest enemies and while numerous battles have been fought between the two forces throughout their existence, this enmity came to a head with the Arios Point Massacre in M38. Stopping for resupply en route to Mancora to celebrate the 5,000th anniversary of the founding of the chapter, the entire 8th Company and much of the 1st Company, led by their then chapter master, 
Orlando Furioso, were ambushed and slaughtered by the Chaos Lord Periclator the Forsworn of the Word Bearers. The traitors seized much of their war gear, including the ancient Terminator armor of First Company, defiled the bodies and stole their gene seed, leaving only the body of the Chapter Master intact for recovery, pinned to the hull of a derelict Thunderhawk in orbit. When the Chapter discovered the slaughter six months later, they swore oaths of vengeance against Periclator, but they'd have the chance to seek that vengeance many times over the coming years. The Howling Griffins are staunch traditionalists within the Adeptus Astartes, cleaving closely to the organizational principles of the Codex Astartes, which they see less as a holy text and more as the finest military treaties ever written. Avowed generalists, they try and maintain the ability to operate in any form the Codex suggests, from planetary strikes to boarding assaults, and insist that their battle brothers attempt to master as many of these forms they're able. Their preferences, though, often place them at the very heart of the battle. Their battle brothers seeking to prove their worth and their metal no matter the cost, which of course leads to that extremely high rate of attrition and turnover of recruits that their forges and apothecaries constantly strive to address. This faith in the tenets of the Codex proves effective at the squad level too. Once in the center of the fighting, the battle brothers of the Howling Griffins are practiced and skilled warriors, possessed of an unshakable faith in their battle doctrines that allows them to act in perfect synchronicity with their brother Astartes, who they can be sure will always hold to their allotted places in the order of battle. Though their marines are removed from their martial upbringing, content to swap their personal and family heraldry for the griffin of the chapter, some practices still remain. The brothers of the Howling Griffins are fond of the swearing of battle oaths, and these oaths, to punish a particular enemy or avenge a fallen comrade, are taken very seriously, often influencing their tactical decisions. Commanding officers might even task or transfer individual battle brothers between companies, aware of the oaths of their subordinates and seeking an opportunity for them to fulfill them. These oaths are sworn frequently, as the chapter culture has a very strong hatred of any form of dishonor. Fueled by their long feud with the word bearers, the merest hint of treachery can provoke an uncontrollably violent response from the Howling Griffins, who've been known to alter battle plans and mission objectives to allow them to seek out and destroy suspected traitors. The chapter also maintains a particularly strong librarian. The population of Mancora produces a higher number of psychers than is normal across the Imperium, and the chapter's recruiters make sure to capture as many of them as possible, testing them for potential as aspirants. The chapter's librarians are famed and powerful battle psychers, who also take an active role in manipulating and policing the population of the homeworld. As always, the Howling Griffins have been active across the Imperium during the 41st millennium. In the first centuries, they fought in two decisive campaigns against traitor forces on Denmark and Asturia. In the second century of the millennia, the third company under Captain Joachim tracked a force of word bearers to the angry world of Denmark 4, which was locked in a brutal civil war between the loyalist and traitor city-states. Landing in the wide savannas and achieving air superiority, the third company rallied the loyal defenders and fought a brutal and bloody campaign, relieving the traitors' sieges of the loyalist cities and smashing the cult. Denmark eventually became a tributary to the chapter, supplying the Howling Griffins with victuals and even more recruits for centuries to come. And when the Heraclean Ironclads Regiment of the Astra Militarum betrayed their oaths and refused to reinforce the battle lines of the Gothic War, taking with them an entire battle group, the Howling Griffins deployed much of their chapter in retaliation. The Ironclads commanding officers, led by General Joran, had been led astray by the Drakari of the Cabal of the Crimson Libation, who supplied the command staff with Xenos narcotics while they reaped Imperial worlds of their population and took them back to Camorra in slavery. The Retaliation Force, consisting of eight companies of the Howling Griffins, with support from the Ultramarines and the Sons of Aura, intercepted the Ironclads at Asturia and slaughtered them at their landing zones. Chaplain Titus fighting his way through the General's Ogrim bodyguard and vile Xenos shadow creatures to kill the traitor. Succumbing to his wounds, the Chaplain was later interred in a Dreadnought sarcophagus as a mark of respect. And in 905 M41, the fourth company, along with elements of the 
the 6th, 10th and 1st companies carried out a search and destroy campaign across the night worlds of the Cara Dryad sector, making use of Codex approved night world camouflage. However, this campaign would be cut short with the outbreak of the Badab War. The Howling Griffins responded to the request for additional forces in the Badab War in 906 M41. Though the task force from the Cara Dryad sector were under strength and under equipped, particularly in terms of planetary assault assets, the idea of chapters of the Astartes turning against the Imperium offended their sense of honor, and instead of resupplying on Mancora, they responded to the call and the task force made all speed directly to the Maelstrom Zone. Arriving with just over 250 Space Marines, the Howling Griffins contingent, including the revered Chaplain Dreadnought Titus, were initially deployed to garrison duties on the airless world of Chimera, reoccupying and rebuilding a series of defense stations and listening posts with the aim of building them into a staging post for a future assault on the Badab sector itself. They were initially unopposed until the entrance into the war of the Executioner's chapter on the side of the Secessionists. Executing a surprise assault, the beleaguered Howling Griffins contingent were slaughtered, their strike cruiser destroyed, and even the Chaplain Dreadnought Titus slain, the task force losing 70% of its operational strength during the assault. But with the newly commissioned orbital defenses reduced to wreckage, the executioners then withdrew, ceasing fire as soon as their military objectives were complete, something that was common in the early stages of the war when the various chapters involved still held some level of respect for their enemies. The few Howling Griffin survivors, reinforced by the Nova Marines, continued to doggedly fight on throughout the war until they were eventually retired in 909, whereupon they returned to Mancora aboard seized secessionist vessels. Their small and disastrous deployment to Badab had little effect on the chapter as a whole though, who continued to campaign throughout the latter days of the 41st millennium and well into the era Indomitus. In 999M41, they were one of the 12 chapters who accompanied the Dark Angels to defend the world of Fenris from the assault of the Thousand Sons, and during the 13th Black Crusade of Abaddon the Despoiler, they sent eight companies to reinforce the Imperial defenses at Cadia. During that war, the Howling Griffins were finally given the chance to avenge themselves on Pereclator when they hunted the Chaos Lord, now ascended into a demon prince, across the Eye of Terror. Their chapter master, Alvaro, followed the trail of a Night Lord's warband across the sector, eventually running Pereclator down on a nameless demon world. It took a night and a day of single combat, battling over the corpses of scores of Howling Griffins, before their chief librarian, Makino, was able to banish the demon back to the warp. The surviving Howling Griffins took an oath never to repeat his name again. And elsewhere in the same war, the second and eighth companies reinforced the Drukian Fenguard on Amistel Majoris, fighting alongside the Iron Knights chapter against the Death Guard in a plague-ridden quagmire, hunting down plague marines and infected zombies in the polluted trenches of the planet. Since the rise of Gilliman and the Indomitus Crusade, and bolstered by the technology required to create Primaris marines, the forges of Mancora have been as busy as ever. Led by either Chapter Master Alvaro or a new Chapter Master called Kenot Frisch, records are unclear, the Howling Griffins fought in the Indomitus Crusade, later providing six companies to aid in the defense of Ultramar during the plague wars against Mortarion. At the same time, three companies were actively involved in the War of Beasts, defending Vigilus and attempting to hold open the Nakmund Gauntlet. And finally, the Howling Griffins were numbered amongst the defenders of Malak Bile during the Arcs of Omen campaign, where they fought in the Battle of Malak against the traitor Primarch. Angron and his World Eaters of Corn. The Howling Griffin's involvement in Badav was barely a blip in seven millennia of campaigning across the Imperium, something they continue into the era Indomitus with barely a pause, their homeworld still churning out the companies, war fleets, and Astartes needed to sustain them. The Howling Griffins are a fun chapter to look at. Unlike some of the other chapters in this series, they're refreshingly straightforward, almost as simple and direct as something like the Black Templars. The chapter itself had been around since the late 80s, but only really as a footnote, only really as a mention in Bad App. It wasn't until the extreme primary colour era of the 90s that they were seen more, mostly because of Fred Reed's beautiful army that popped up regularly in White Dwarf, and it wasn't until 
much later that their background would be fleshed out, combining the knightly overtones of all that heraldry without taking it too far. And even though they don't make much of a dent in the Badad campaign, they're still there for quite a lot of it, even painted in a scheme that makes an army of them a way less daunting prospect. I'm looking forward to seeing if anyone chooses them for the upcoming campaign we're running. Until then, thanks for watching. And if you'd like to hear more about the chapters of the Bad Ab War, there should be a little box popping up there on the right. And if you'd like to support the channel, there are links to the YouTube membership scheme and the Patreon in the thing below. There's affiliate links for Firestorm Games. And of course, you can like and subscribe here. See ya!